Morag the sleepy cat is a curious sweet soul. She explores, she dares, and she pushes the boundaries of what it means to be a cat at all. But she is no normal cat. Join her on this new adventure through Scotland's seasonal farmlands, where she encounters a spooky surprise. So lie back, take a nice deep breath, and welcome to Snooze with Sam. It had been a busy morning on the farm that particular day. Tractors and heavy machinery plunged up and down the muddy tracks, to and from silos and sheds, to fields and pastures. They were in a near continuous train of livestock and produce. It was harvest season, and as far as Morag the sleepy cat could tell, the farmers were putting a lot of effort into recovering their investments. But aside from that observation, Morag had little interest in the specifics of what was going on. She just liked watching them all hurry about from her favourite spot on the dry stone wall, next to the turnip field. Well, it used to be a turnip field until the sheep came along. She realised that the farmers often did that every fall season. That is, to cultivate an entire field of turnips purely to let the sheep munch away on them whilst the grass growth slows for winter. How lucky those sheep were, she thought to herself. Spoiled, almost. Imagine having an entire acre of food grown and set in front of you, just for them all to hoover it up without so much of a thank you. Morag rolled her eyes at the concept, chastising the sheep for their entitled ways. Presently, she felt a little murmuring in her tummy, and assumed it to be hunger. It had been a while since her breakfast, Perhaps she should call upon her human to feed her, she thought. Morag decided it would be best to eat a little later, as she was enjoying being outside far too much. Having had enough of watching farm life whiz by, 
she dropped down off the dry stone wall and into the field of sheep. She may not have thought all too highly of them, but she did at least show them some basic manners, or whatever a cat's version of that really is, as nobody really knows. Giving the sheep a healthy birth, she pawed through the rutted mud and roots, finding a path of least resistance. The woolly maggots watched on, eyes seemingly pointing whichever way the wind took them. There they were, hundreds of them, watching her every move, rotating slowly on the spot as Morag glided around the perimeter of the field, practically hypnotised by her presence. She decided to have some fun and test the sheep's metal. And so she paused in her tracks and faced them head on, no longer moving. Checkmate, she thought. A few of the nearest sheep seemed to flinch in alarm having been caught entirely off guard by her audacious chess move. By the looks on their glacate faces, some of the sheep would have sooner expected her to tap dance than stop walking. Morag then lifted one paw off the mud and began to move it in the direction of the sheep. And that was all it took. As if a silent bomb had gone off, releasing all of the tension in the air, the sheep scattered in a cataclysmic frenzy of woollen limbs, fleeing the frightening scene which had unfolded. If Morag could smile a mischievous smile, she certainly was doing just that. After allowing the satisfaction to absorb and circulate, Feeling much more content, she padded onwards, crisp autumnal air and sunshine refreshing her every minute passing. At the end of the turnip slash sheep field, she saw the hedgerow through which fox had led her not too long before. That was a beautiful night, and one she would cherish for many moons to come. Not only had her best friend shown her somewhere she'd never explored, but to have gazed upon the stars and seen her spirits dance across the night sky was something she would never forget. Leaving that memory as a cherished one, she opted to bypass the hedgerows and continue through the neighbouring fields. 
In these fields grew Brussels sprouts, rich purple and leafy kale, and more turnips, though these ones didn't have any sheep attached to them, thankfully. In particular, Morag enjoyed weaving and zigzagging her way through the Brussels stalks, letting her soft ginger tail stroke the little veggies as she passed. Sooner or later, she would see them inside the house on a dinner plate. Not that she'd be anywhere near them, if she could help it. Morag's palette was a varied one. Yet despite her innate curiosity, she found Sprouts to be on the foul side of that line. And then, not far beyond the sprout field, she came to a crossing in the road, and looked both ways before doing so, just like her mum had taught her. There was something in the field on the far side which intrigued her, and so off she briskly padded, feeling the cool, hard pavement beneath her feet. Through a gap in the stonework she aimed, and she got a better view of what it was that piqued her interest. It looked like an enormous field of orange and green-white balloons. Oh, she thought to herself, it's those funny-looking vegetables that my owner has a few of in the kitchen. What are they called again? Oh yes, that's it. Plumpkins or something like that. They only appeared once a year, and they always seemed to be at the heart of everything that was cooked for a period. Soups, pies, roasted veg, and delicious smelling toasted seeds. Morag had seen and smelled it all, and she had to admit, though she didn't much enjoy the taste of some of the food, she loved the smell of all of it. It made her feel very seasonal and festive, whatever that means to a cat. The thought of all of these aromas made her wee mouth water, and so she snapped out of it before hunger really struck. There was one orange balloon nestled amongst the straw and green vines, which seemed odd. There was something about the front of it. Was that a face drawn into it? Oh, of course. She'd seen pictures of them before, too or read about them, one way or another. 
it was something to do with this Halloween festival that humans celebrate. Most cats don't enjoy reading, or can't read at all. But Morag was full of surprises, and often kept her talents to herself. She sauntered closer to the expressionist pumpkin, and noted the ghoulish smile it wore with menacing eyes. That won't scare me, she thought. It'll take more than that. And at that precise moment, the top of the pumpkin flew off in an eruption of seeds and dried pulp followed by none other than a cat. And at that very same moment, Morag leapt high into the air with a startle, back arched and tail fluffed in alarm. The cat which sat in the pumpkin was a brown and white mackerel tabby cat with a big patch of brown over its nose. He gazed at you with big, amber, equally surprised eyes. You frightened the life out of me, Morag said. You and me both. I was just exploring and found this funny looking house with holes in it, and so I crawled in. Smells a bit in there though, wouldn't recommend it, he replied. Who are you then? prompted Morag, still catching her breath. My name is Patch, and you are? My name's Morag. Very pleased to meet you. After a moment or two of exchanging cat small talk and getting to know each other a wee bit more, Patch asked Morag if she knew why this particular orange balloon had been hollowed out and had a face in it. Well, Patch, there is this thing that the humans do every year around this time. And so, sat there happily in the field of bright orange pumpkins beneath the low sun and crisp afternoon air. Morag told to Patch the story of how Halloween came to be. Halloween traditions in the West dated back thousands of years to the festival of the Suwen the Celtic New Year's Festival. The name meant Summer's End, and the festival marked the close of the harvest season and the coming of winter. The Celts believed that the veil between the worlds of the living and the deceased were thinnest at this time and so the dead could return and walk where they had before. Furthermore, those who had died in the past year, and who for one reason or another had not yet moved on, could do so at this time, 
and might interact with the living in saying goodbye. Very little was known of the rituals of the ancient Su Wen, because the church Christianized it. As with many pagan festivals, and what information was available came from Irish monks who recorded the pre-Christian history of their people as well as other Christian scribes denigrating pagan rites. It seemed, however, that the observance included stocking up supplies for the winter slaughtering cattle, and disposing of the bones in bone fires, which in time came to be known as bonfires. There were gatherings of communities for feasting and drinking while this was going on, but there was also the awareness of the thin time of the year and the possibility of otherworldly visitors showing up at the party. Departed loved ones were expected and welcomed, and the practice of setting out favourite foods for the dead may have originated as early as 2,000 years ago though this is still unclear. But many other kinds of spirits, some which never had human form, could also appear. Elves, fairies, the wee folk, sprites, and dark energies were just as likely to pay a visit as those one longed to see again one last time. Furthermore, there was a very good chance that the spirit of a person one may have wronged would also make an appearance. In order to deceive the spirits, People darkened their faces with ashes from the bonfires, a practice later known as guising, and this developed into wearing masks. A living person would recognise the spirit of a loved one and could then reveal themselves, but otherwise remain safe from the unwanted attention of darker forces. Ooh, that's so interesting, Patch excitedly remarked. These humans are so very complicated with their beliefs and celebrations and stuff. But, but wait, w what about this big veg with the face on it? I've still not heard anything about this. And so, Morag proceeded to tell the story of the jack-o'-lantern. The jack-o'-lantern was associated with the Irish folk tale of Stingy Jack, a clever drunk and conman who fooled the devil into banning him from hell. However, because of his sinful life, could not enter heaven. After his death, he roamed the world carrying a small lantern made of a turnip with a red-hot ember from hell inside 
to light his way. Scholars believed this legend evolved from sightings of will-o'-the-wisp, swamp and marsh gases which glowed in the night. On All Hallows' Eve, the Irish hollowed out turnips and carved them with faces, placing a candle inside. So as they went about soaring on the night, when the veil between life and death was thinnest, they would be protected from spirits like Stingy Jack. And then, over time, people realised that turnips are actually very difficult to carve, and people opted to carve pumpkins instead, because it's easier. Patch sat there, still, mouth dropped. Wow, that's Spooky. And then, having realised what he had just said and heard, he promptly sprung out of the spooky pumpkin face thing and whacked it a couple of times with his paw, just to send a message to any ghosts or ghouls which may be lingering nearby. Oh, those pesky spooks. They're giving me the heebie-jeebies, Patch said. Is this all these plumpkin things are good for? Hmm, not entirely. Morag said. And then Morag had an idea. Why don't you come with me? There's some things I want you to see. Following Morag back through the fields of sprouts, turnips, kale, and sheep turnips. Patch took in all the new sights and sounds of somewhere he'd never been. It was like a whole new adventure, and he had a new friend to share the experience with. Morag was also thinking the same thing. It was nice to have a fellow cat pal for company. They hopped up onto the dry stone wall of the farm and balanced across it to the corner where Morag's house sat just a little further off. Down they went, in single file, right through the garden gate, across the grass where the chickens pecked and scratched, and up onto the kitchen windowsill, where one of the windows was slightly ajar. It was here that Morag wanted to show Patch all of the magic that happened in Black Hill Farm Cottage. Go on, Patch. Look inside. Morag prompted him to peer inside the window, getting his nose closer to see past their own reflections. And it was at this point 
where Patches world upturned into an eternal state of wonderment and salivation. Morag, I've never seen anything like it before. Across the floor, all dressed in aprons and tea towels, Morag's human effortlessly floated around the kitchen between worktops, ovens and mixing bowls. She was in her element, cooking everything she could muster with the year's harvest to share with her family and her neighbours. On one hop, Patch saw a large pot filled with what looked like a lovely creamy soup. And next to that sat a loaf of freshly baked bread resting underneath a tea towel. Across the room, the oven was burning away happily, and inside, the cats could see three very tasty looking pies baking, and they looked nearly ready. In that moment, a small breeze must have blown across them for the most tantalising and blissful aroma of baking apples, pumpkins and cinnamon spices was swept from within the kitchen straight across the path of their wee noses. Patch almost collapsed with pleasure and started to meow involuntarily. This made the lady look up from her business with such a smile that she rushed straight over to the window to greet her own Morag and this new cat that she'd brought with her. She wanted to open the window, however, before she did, she had an idea of her own. Promptly, she shuffled over to the oven and retrieved one of the pies. She cut two small slices lay them in a pair of dishes and, on the side, placed two tiny bowls and into it poured a little ladle of pumpkin soup. Both Morag and Patch knew what was coming and excitedly paced left and right on the sill outside. At long last, and after the delicious food had cooled just enough, the lady came to them, opened the window, and invited them in. She then placed the dishes down on the floor next to the wood-burning stove where the two cats feasted enthusiastically. The powers of glee were so loud that the lady laughed and rejoiced in seeing these two adorable wee moggies so contented. She left them to it, 
and allowed both Morag and Patch to enjoy their treats and continued bustling around the kitchen, cooking up a storm. Eventually, after a lot of plate licking and mouth washing, the two cats slumped down lazily by the warm fire and very happy Morag and the pumpkin cat fell asleep.